Um, and again, I'll just say we are recording this event. So if you're uncomfortably re being recorded, feel free to turn your camera off or change your name. Um, and also there will be several periods throughout the event where we'll accept audience questions. So if uh, questions come up at any point, uh, please message Abby um, and it should say Abby Maine Conservation Voters. So if any questions pop out throughout, please um, just send her a chat with those questions and we will hopefully get to answering them. So thank you again for joining. Good afternoon um, and welcome to the virtual Solarize Maine School Summit. My name is Siri Pierce and I'm a senior at Casco Bay High School in Portland. Thank you for joining us in the midst of a pandemic and to support youth and solar energy. It means a lot that you're here. Um, and I'd also like to take a moment to thank all of our incredible experts for volunteering their time to be here tonight and all our community partners for their support, including Maine Conservation Voters, Space Gallery, Campaign Earth, the CR Club, and Revision Energy. Thank you so much for uh, all your support throughout this process. So this event was originally planned to be an in-person summit in March and the culmination of my senior expedition. Obviously, circumstances changed quite dramatically, very quickly, but I still hope this event will not be just a culmination, but rather the start of a network of students, teachers, and community members working towards transitioning main schools towards solar power. For the past two years, I've been involved with Solarize Portland, a collaboration of students advocating for solar for Portland school roofs. We marched and fundraised and spoke at what seemed like dozens of school board meetings. Until this past August, the school board signed a resolution for a 3.5 megawatt offsite solar array. This re resolution has since evolved into a plan for the city of Portland to join a consortium of businesses and towns to purchase 20 million kilowatt hours of electricity from remote solar arrays through net metering. That is equivalent to two thirds of our city's annual electrical consumption. So let me just share my screen real quick. So other schools across Maine are beginning to tap into the advantages of solar energy. Mount Desert Highland High School recently celebrated the installation of a 1,400 panel array that will save them over a million dollars in the next 25 years. Camden Hills Regional High School has also installed a rooftop solar array as well as a wind turbine. Countless other schools, some of which are represented on the Zoom call here tonight, are leading solar campaigns at their respective schools. When we think of climate action, we think of large scale systematic change on the national and international level. We think of the Paris Climate Agreement and the United Nations. We think of a Green New Deal and the 2020 presidential elections. But in this politically divisive time, it is becoming increasingly challenging to rely on our national and global leaders to bring about the change we wanna see. While we must continue to think nationally and globally, we must shift our focus towards grassroots, community-driven climate action on the local and statewide level. Action that can and should start with our schools. Nationwide, only 4.4% of schools utilize solar energy. The financial and structural barriers that once prevented schools from reaping the benefits of solar are gradually disappearing. Solar panels are no longer an expensive dream, but a cost-effective reality. Over the past decade, the average cost of solar panels for schools has decreased 67%. Financing methods like power purchase agreements have made solar projects more economically feasible for school districts. And solar arrays are far more than a source of energy. Whoops. My slideshow isn't working. We'll do it with that. <laughs> 
So they can be a powerful educational tool. So in my research, I read about schools using the data from solar panels to teach elementary students about everything from fractions and statistical measures like mean and median to the behavior of light and energy production. Solar panels can empower the next generation of learners to explore skills in engineering, environmental policy, and mathematics, skills that will prepare them to tackle the environmental challenges of the future. However, as promising as the opportunity of solar in schools is, there are few resources and information for students interested in going solar, in schools interested in going solar. The goal of my senior expedition in this summit is to prepare and empower young people, teachers, and community members to go back to their schools and communities and advocate for solar. I hope that after tonight, we can continue to use this incredible network of individuals to support each other as we kickstart and continue solar campaigns at schools across the state. I've created a website with information about the summit and resources for districts embarking on the process, including a guide that I created with the help of experts. And I believe that um, link to the website will be sent to the chat soon. Um, and if not, it'll also be sent in an email to everyone who registered for the event. Um, and I'd also really appreciate it if you filled out a survey at the end of this event, um, which will also be sent out an email tomorrow to everyone who registered. Um, but just to get some information about um, your experience here tonight and your next steps moving forward. So thank you in advance for filling that survey out. Youth across the world are holding leaders accountable for their lack of climate action, and it's time to hold our cities and schools accountable as well. Schools play a pivotal role in preparing youth for the future. And in this moment, that future is tainted by a looming crisis. Youth can and should lead our state towards a clean energy future, and we can start by solarizing our schools. So at this point, we're going to transition into our first panel discussion focused on Maine solar legislation and policy with the guiding question, what do we need to know about Maine state law and local politics in order to solarize my school or community? So I'd like to turn it over to our experts to introduce our, themselves and uh, we'll start with Selena Cunningham. Hi everyone, thanks for organizing this event. Selena Cunningham, uh, Deputy Director at the Governor's Energy Office. We work on policy, energy policy for the state, including renewable energy um, priorities for the governor. Thank you, and next we have Chloe Maxman. Hi everyone, my name is Chloe Maxman. I'm the state representative for District 88, which includes Chelsea, Whitefield, Jefferson, and half of Nobleboro, and I am the sponsor of the Maine Green New Deal. And next we have Hannah Pingree. Hello everyone, it's great to see um, so many familiar faces and thank you Siri for awesome organization. Um, my name is Hannah Pinkery. I am director of the governor's office of policy innovation in the future. Um, we help uh, lead the governor's climate efforts and I also co-chair the Maine Climate Council. So thanks again. And finally we have Robert Stoddard. Hi everyone, I'm Robert Stoddard with the uh, Berkeley Research Group. I'm a managing director in the energy and climate practice there. Uh, I also have the privilege of being a member of the energy working group of the Maine Climate Council. Thank you all. Um, and we'll start with our first question, um, just to get a general sense of your thoughts and feelings. Um, why should we solarize our schools and what are your hopes for Maine solar future? And um, if you would like to respond, panelists, just please give a hand raise. Um, physical ver versus virtual would be preferred. Thank you. Perfect, we'll go with Hannah first, thank you. Great, well, I mean, so Siri, I would just say that I think um, you've already explained it well. I think that youth have been among the leading forces of the climate movement um, in Maine and around the world, which is um, exciting to see and important. Uh, the governor has made climate one of her um, top issues. Obviously, we're all living in a very bizarre time, but she still continues to believe that climate is one of the most important issues um, facing Maine, facing our world. 
Um, I think as, as many of you know, um, we passed a, a significant law last year to create the Maine Climate Council um, to set significant emission reduction goals for 2030 and 2050, um, as well as to pass um, a new renewable portfolio standard, which requires Maine to get 80% of our electricity from renewable sources by 2030. Um, that is the most uh, aggressive renewable energy portfolio standard of any state in the country. Um, and, and obviously could also mean a lot of good paying jobs, a lot of um, renewable energy development for the state of Maine. Um, I would just say that I think, um, again, as you've said, well, putting this on our schools um, is a way to save taxpayer dollars. It's also a way for us to really make sure that we are leading by example in the places that, that matter to us a lot. And I think because youth care about this issue, because they are places um, we all pay for, um, it makes a whole lot of sense. Um, obviously, I think uh, as, as some of you probably heard this last legislative session, not just uh, solar on schools, but also how do we electrify our, our transportation, including school buses as a leading example. I think there's a lot of things that we can do um, and finding ways and tools um, to make that possible has been a priority. Um, Selena or Robert um, would probably be best to talk about it, but we passed a number of pieces of legislation um, in the last uh, legislative session. Uh, to make it uh, more feasible um, to, so, to put solar on schools, to put it on municipal buildings, for community groups to buy it together, and to also procure large amounts of solar to help um, fuel our whole grid. So um, we couldn't agree with you more, and I think the example um, is, is really key, but also it's just the beginning of what we need to do everywhere. Thank you, Robert. Yep. And Hannah, I completely agree with that. Let me try to chunk it to two really simple things. First, it saves money. I think this was one of the things that we got a unanimous vote at the Portland School Board because there was no reason to object to it. It was clearly going to project to save money over time. It required no cash up front. It's just good economics. And that's in large part to the legislative process that put out a sensible framework to make that happen, which we can talk about in more detail later. The other good reason is to make it familiar to the students and then to their parents. I was really astounded at the Portland School Board meeting where this was being discussed. The level of misunderstanding about how solar works, how it works with the grid, how it helps the whole process. And having that in an open public discussion and then kids get excited by it and their parents are excited by it, it creates a groundswell of, of social energy that can then transform how we get our electrical energy. Thank you, uh, Chloe. Thank you, Siri. Um, so great to be here and hear everyone's thoughts. One other thing that I wanted to throw out there is that um, in addition to young folks knowing what's right and wrong and always having the moral clarity of truth, I think um, one of the things that's really interesting to me about putting solar on schools is how that intersects with other um, economic justice issues in rural communities because up where I come from people really want to do it but um, but our school budgets are are already so tight and I, whenever I knock on doors or talk with constituents the property taxes are one of the biggest things that I hear um, that folks are struggling with in our in our rural towns and really all of our towns and so I think it's really and like such an intersectional conversation as well and a conversation that's really important to make sure that as we're transitioning our schools to a different form of energy that that burden does not unnecessarily fall on the folks who can least afford it so it's a um it's an intersectional just transition conversation as well which i think is um is so important since young folks really understand that dynamic and can lead that conversation thank you selena I think everyone has summed up uh, why it's so important. The only thing I'd add is the in building on the tangible element of it is that it, you can see how individually you can make a real difference in your community and also in the ability for the state to meet our, our climate and energy goals. And it will teach you and um, the students how to how to make that a reality for not only the project that you support now, but for the rest of your, your lives. And so I think we can all have an uh, ability to impact and influence our energy future. Thank you. 
Um, and I heard uh, several of you mention legislation and the impact that's had on the cost of solar and how this began, this, how solar can be not just um, an environmental solution or an educational solution, but something that actually saves school districts money um, in the long term and how schools can initially afford that upfront. So what are some of these pieces of legislation or policy that have um, impacted the cost of solar for school districts? Yeah, I can take that or at least get the start on it and whoever can build on it. So in the first session uh, after Janet Mills was sworn in, we got three major pieces of legislation through that, I would say, widespread support across the legislature that affect the solar industry in a very positive way. The first that went through was a requirement that the utilities use net energy metering. And that had been a, a, something been unwound by the Public Utility Commission and this law reversed the Public Utility Commission action. So in net metering, it's, it's really pretty simple that every kilowatt hour you generate from your solar panel reduces the kilowatt hour usage on your electric bill one for one. And it even allows that if, for instance, in July, when a lot of schools are closed, their power use may be low, energy they generate in July is banked from a accounting perspective into the winter months when they're producing less power but using more. So having net metering makes a very simple structure for a school or any building to put panels on their roofs and get full physical credit for that power. The second piece that's really directly important was LD 1711, which is a complex bill and has two distinct portions, both of which can be relevant for schools. Um, the first is to allow off-site farms that still benefit from this net, net energy metering. Not every school building or every participant it, has a roof that's appropriate. We found this at the Portland schools. Many of the school buildings just didn't have sound roofs or unbroken roofs, roofs that would have made it economical to put solar panels on the top. But this legislation allows the sort of action that Portland is taking, which is to commission a single large array offsite and allocate those kilowatt hours back to the school buildings. Um, and there's a complex issue here about allocating it from a kilowatt hour basis or allocating it from a dollars basis. Basically, you have an option there that could be very beneficial as well in making the economics work for schools and other large general service customers who pay a substantial demand charge as well as the kilowatt hour charge. The second piece of that bill uh, directs the utilities to procure and give long-term contracts for 375 megawatts of new solar in the state of Maine. Uh, and that is a really interesting option because it makes the financing costs so much simpler because you have a guaranteed fixed price contract from the utility, which helps with finding someone who's willing to finance it, addressing Chloe's concern about, you know, how do schools actually come up with the cash to pay this? Well, there are financing techniques that you don't need any cash. It can all be done with a third party investor, the school getting cheap power, the investor getting a fair return on their money and um, the contract with the utility providing the backing. Um, finally, and not so much relevant for the schools, but certainly relevant for the industry here in Maine uh, is a, a third bill that directs as part of the RPS increases direct procurement by the utilities of large amounts of solar energy. And so this is grid scale solar, uh, very large projects. And that is proceeding apace and is very exciting uh, potential results there. Thank you, uh, Selena. That was a great description of the, uh, the legislation that was passed in the last uh, year. And I, the only piece that I'd, I'd add is that this has been a game changer in terms of how the solar industry is, is operating in the state. And there is 
a ton of interest and competition from developers and others in the state who really want to build a, a strong solar industry that's going to be here to stay. And so that only creates more options in terms of the type, um, the types of programs and, and um, companies that schools have to choose from when, ch when building out projects. So I, I omitted one important law change as well, which is a requirement that all new school buildings, um, main efficiency trust comes in and evaluates suitability for solar. And if feasible, they use their bonding authority or their, their, their cash flow to give a contract for solar on the roof of new school buildings. So that's a very direct way that as a school district is, is modernizing its schools, it has a chance to have the state come in in a very direct way and support solar on the school. Just in, I was there, that, that was Representative Maxim's bill, right? That was part of the Green New Deal bill, so. Yes, that was, that's what that was good. And that was actually sort of bringing back, yeah. I think it doesn't need to be said, but clearly, Maine, uh, I was in the legislature uh, now more than 10 years ago, and we were making really good progress on some of these issues. Uh, Maine was being aggressive with renewable energy, and then we entered sort of a dark period. So uh, it has brightened up, and we, are, we, we passed a lot of amazing legislation in the last um, two years, of which that was among them. We used to do a much better job 10 years ago, making sure every school was efficient, was built efficiently. All those standards went away for a little while, so now we're in the process of, of bringing them back. So that was a, a great new effort to add solar to that. Thank you all for those. Uh, yes, Chloe, go ahead. Oh yes, just one, just to, because um, I, so I was the sponsor of the Green New Deal and there are two kind of final components to it. And one of the biggest chunks was really making sure that there is support for school districts that are trying to transition to solar energy so that there isn't that undue burden on property taxpayers. Um, and again, just bringing the just transition frame into all that all that we talk about and making sure that we're really intentionally creating um, a more just energy system than the one that we're leaving behind. Thank you. I'm curious to see, because you um, all had kind of talked about how there was um, some significant legislation and then it kind of um, was backtracked a little bit and then had to move forward. How has the pandemic affected um, the status of, I know there were some bills that were put on hold. Um, how has that affected not just solar, but renewable energy legislation in the state? Um, and what, what are the steps moving forward? Go ahead. Uh, I mean, uh, the good news is a, we made a lot of progress about a year ago. This, the legislative session that ended last June was was really, really positive and made a ton of um, huge jumps forward. It also created the Climate Council, which is continuing to work virtually through this pandemic with many of you participating, so thank you. Um, so I, I think this legislative session, there were some bills ha that have been carried over that were put on hold. Uh, they continue to be on hold. We hope that they don't all die and because we, we have some important things still hanging out there that we hope we find some way to deal with at least by fall. Um, but again, I, all the solar stuff we just talked about move for, is moving forward. The Climate Council's uh, report, um, all the working groups are reporting out their ideas um, this June, and the, it, we are on track to have a, a four-year action plan by December. So we are, we're trying not to let this pandemic slow us down, um, but I will say clearly a significant recession um, is going to be challenging for many main communities, for schools, for budgets, for the state budget. And so I think one of the things um, I hope everybody on this call will consider is that um, a lot of folks are calling for a uh, recovery effort coming out of Washington that really rebuilds our economy in a green and sustainable way. Um, that certainly happened under Obama in 2009. We had a huge stimulus bill that put tons of money into weatherization into energy programs, into renewable energy, and it created um, thousands of, of good paying jobs that were in these industries. So we're in a slightly different situation with our current makeup in Washington, but a lot of folks are asking for green recovery work. Um, so I think that's something to think about how we all push for. And I think that, you know, that those efforts last time, there was a push around schools as well to help them become more efficient. Um, and so I think, I think that's something that should be on the radar screen. 
ahead, if I can supplement that, um, on the legislative front, I completely agree that that's a there wasn't much in the hopper that was critical to move forward. We we got so much done in that first term. Where there have been some issues with the pandemic are on the regulatory and the supply chain front. Uh, the Public Utilities Commission is plugging along valiantly, but they had to shift and figure out how to do open meetings virtually. Um, they've had staff, you know, it's hard to work as a, as a coordinated team. And there's a lot of work that the Public Utility Commission was given from that first legislative session and rulemakings and auction processes and that. So it, they're a little behind and th there's been some extensions of timetables there. Um, the other challenge is that a lot of the supply chains critical in solar have been severely disrupted by the pandemic. I mean, unsurprisingly, a lot of materials for this industry come from China. That was disrupted. The shipping has been disrupted. So um, we have a member from Revision Energy coming on the next panel, and I think he could probably speak more directly to how that's been happening. But projects that are underway are probably getting a little delayed by either regulatory or supply chain issues. Thank you. Um, and I wanted to touch upon one of the more confusing aspects of um, solar and uh, so people can get some clarity around it. Um, and that's net metering. I think um, this is definitely a challenging topic to grasp for students. I definitely know it was for me. So I'm curious if someone would be willing to explain how it works and how schools can benefit from it. I know well, I can take it. Go, you go. Okay. Um, so at some level, it, let's take a really simple analogy. Um, suppose you grow some tomatoes in your backyard. Um, those are tomatoes you don't have to buy at Hannaford. And you end up only paying for the tomatoes you bought from Hannaford. Full stop. Um, that's effectively what net metering is. You are growing your own electricity on your rooftop and that means your meter doesn't run as fast sometimes because the power you need from the grid is less. And so it's, it's really in a lot of ways, a lot like the Hannaford example, where instead of going to CMP and buying power, you're going to your rooftop and buying power. The, the trick of the problem and, and the, the challenge with this is, um, Twofold. First, what happens if you are producing more tomatoes than your household is eating at the time? And, you know, we don't have an easy way of, of putting electricity on your neighbor's doorstep uh, as we would with tomatoes. But it's, it's instead, CMP buys it back. And the question is, at what price? And what we've said for simplicity, which is approximately accurate, is we'll just do it at the same rate as you buy it at. Now, there's been a challenge with that, that from you know, how the utility accounting works and who's paying for the wires and all the infrastructure. But as a general matter, the value of solar energy on the grid is much higher than generic energy for a number of reasons. And so the way this works is really just simple accounting. If you produced if your panels produced 100 kilowatt hours in a month and you used 120 kilowatt hours in total, you're only being billed the difference, 20, megawatt, 20 kilowatt hours from CMP. Um, if instead you produced uh, 200 kilowatt hours in that month and you still only used 120, CMP would credit your account with 80 kilowatt hours and roll that forward to months where your usage was higher than your production. Uh, so it's just a way of doing an accounting with kilowatt hours as the unit of count. Now that works great for households because almost all of our bill at your house is charged by the kilowatt hour. For larger buildings, most schools are either medium general service or large general service accounts. 
And that's a different tariff structure. And a large part of the charge comes from what's called a demand charge. So the, the peak hour of usage in a month will set part of the rate and then the usage, the kilowatt hours will set another part of the rate. It turns out therefore that the, the, that straight kilowatt hour accounting isn't nearly as valuable for a large customer like a school as it is for a residential customer. And so in the LD 1711 structure, we created a different way of counting net metering where basically it's treating dollar values rather than kilowatt hour values. And you know, the, the math on that's a little complicated, but the structure of the bill makes it much more useful from a financial point of view for large buildings, which after all are really best for, for large rooftop arrays, to install those and credit those on their accounts directly. Um, so that's sort of on-site net metering. You've got a panel and the panel is behind the electric meter from CMP. CMP was actually threatening or the, the Public Utility Commission was, was going to require that there be two meters on every house where, that had solar where it was measuring, measuring in and out. And that was clearly an expense that was burdensome to customers and to the solar providers. The other approach to net metering, so what we call virtual net metering, Robert, I'm sorry where... to interrupt you, but yeah, we yeah, have, yeah. Go ahead. For time time purposes, we're going to move on. Okay. But thank you for your very thorough explanation. And if anyone has any further questions about net metering and want to hear the full length of that explanation, we can do that. You can do that in the breakout session. So go to Robert's breakout session if you're interested in learning more about net metering. So um, I'm going to ask one more question, and then I'll take um, two questions from the audience. So. Um, my final question is, what can students and community members do to support solar legislation in the coming months and years? Yes, Selena first. I'll just say that the, the, one of the most important things you can do is to share your stories. You have you've done incredible work to put together um, uh, solar arrays and other, other projects in your schools and communities. And, telling your story to the newspaper and, your, and other people in your community really helps things uh, share, uh, just share the, uh, the success. And um, there are organizations and groups that track solar policy and other renewable energy policy in, in Augusta. And to the extent that you're interested, you know, to engage there is always great to hear from the youth in the community as well. Thank you. And Hannah, I saw you raise your hand. Great. Chloe had her hand up as well. So um, I, I totally agree with what Selena just said. I would say that um, school decisions are driven locally, and I think as everyone knows. And so I think for all of the climate action that we take, we hope that the state takes bold action. We hope the federal government eventually takes bold federal action, but a lot is in the power of the towns and school boards. Um, so I think, uh, I think, I hope the state, we will continue to create more tools um, to support that. We had a, a bond in the last legislative session that would help um, finance more uh, locally driven um, projects from solar on schools to electric school buses to other types of municipal projects. So uh, that has not moved forward yet. So help us support those things in the future. Um, I think as, as you might've said at the beginning, Siri, I think part of our challenge is to make sure that we really do spread this out to rural areas of our state where, you know, schools or towns are concerned with their property taxes, where people might lack, um, you know, who, it's a, it's a lot of work to figure out a power purchase agreement to put solar on a school. And so people need support for that. So coming up with more tools um, at the regional level, at the state level to support towns and school boards and students who want to do that. I think that's one of the things that I hope comes out of our climate action plan. Um, and again, I think just, uh, you know, bold, helping us work for bold climate action through this coming year is going to be key. I think a lot of, uh, there's a lot of challenges for many main people um, losing their jobs, worried about their health and safety. Um, but we know, and we just saw a poll today that the vast majority of Mainers still believe this is important. So I think solar on schools and how we push for it at the local level and state level 
um, will help keep this conversation alive. Thank you, and um, Chloe? Thanks, Siri. Um, one other thing that I wanted to say is that so much of the conversation that we're having right now centers around policy and politics. And I, I find that's often the case when we're talking around climate, where we're like alluding to the fact that it all really depends upon policy, but we don't really name it. And so um, I, one thing that I always encourage young folks to do is to sit down with your state representative and your state senator and get them on record saying that they're going to be supporting solar legislation and even specific bills and then hold them accountable. Like um, being held accountable is a super uncomfortable experience as somebody in that, um, in that position, but that is what elected officials are supposed to do and um, they're supposed to be responsive to the people that they represent. And I think that rebuilding that kind of relationship between constituents and politics is gonna be so crucial to continuing to have the kind of solar policy that we need going forward. Thank you. Um, so now we're gonna take some audience questions. And this first question um, is from Gus Goodwin and he says, um, does the law that Robert explained regarding solar on new schools, so I believe this is the uh, bill that Chloe sponsored, um, uh, does it apply to schools getting renovations? No, it does not. I was just looking at the language again. It's only for new school construction, but there is another piece of the bill that does provide incentives for energy efficiency and renewable energy projects on existing schools. Thank you. And this next question is from Mike. What stakeholders have been most successful in getting their schools to adopt solar energy? Example, students, administrators, school board, community members. What I saw at the Portland School Board was that the presence of a large number of motivated, informed students pushed things in a direction that was inevitable. I mean, it's, you just can't say no when the kids are there making intelligent, reasoned arguments, have done their homework, and can answer all the questions. It, it was a great, it was a great moment to see that. Great, so this next question is from John Neal and he says, my school rents its space from a summer camp. Can incentives for installing solar on new buildings apply in that situation? I don't, the, I, I don't think so. The language is pretty specific around new schools construction, um, but I could take a closer look and figure that one out unless Hannah knows. No, I was trying to even fully understand the question of whether or not they were building a new school or trying to put it on a rented building or, I mean, there is, we do allow you to buy your power from elsewhere. So groups of community members or buyers can, can kind of purchase as a community solar type project, which might be able to apply. I'm, I guess I'm sort of missing exactly how they're trying to accomplish it. Awesome, and um, one final question. Uh, this was a question uh, about cons the consumer owned utility bill um, and how that would affect our clean energy transition in Maine. I mean, I think that bill is still um, floating around and is being, I think there's a couple of, Selena probably even knows best, there's a couple of studies uh, that were that were needing to be done. Um, I think the concept, I think either way you're asking utilities to purchase um, your, your energy back through net metering and through other measures. I think that some of the benefits that, that folks are talking about with the um, community owned utility would be, it might be easier to work with those utilities. The, the cost of installing large scale um, uh, grid might be different. Um, I don't know, Selena, do you want to, I'm trying to envision how it could actually impact solar on schools. I don't know what, that would have a direct impact because we'd still be working with the same programs that we have now. And so um, I, I think it's, I know that there is an effort underway to take a look at it and assess it and to see what the full suite of the impacts would be. Um, but I don't know that off the top, there's a, a direct link to, to schools right now. 
Well, um, thank you all so much for your time. And um, if there are any more questions about solar policy and legislation in particular, feel free to join that breakout session at the end with Robert. Um, but thank you so much to Robert, Hannah, Chloe, and Selena for your time. Let's give them a virtual round of applause. <laughs> I'd say thank you, Siri. That was awesome. Great job organizing this. Thank you. Um, so at this point, we're going to move on to our next panel discussion, uh, which is with experts in school solar campaigns. So we will begin this conversation with the guiding question, how can we make solar happen at our schools? How can we turn our great idea into a reality? So um, experts, if you could please introduce yourself. We're going to start with uh, David Gibson. Hi everyone, uh, I'm David Gibson. I'm a, an employee owner at Revision Energy and I also serve on the Sierra Club Executive Committee here in Maine. Um, and I have eight years of experience out in Reno, Nevada working with schools, um, both creating in-classroom education materials and curriculum to teach middle school and high school students how to live more efficiently and make their schools more efficient as well as for the Nevada Governor's Office of Energy implementing efficiency programs statewide. And we did about $50 million in efficiency projects with schools around the state. Um, so um, both the education side of it and implementing projects. Thank you, Sarah. Hi, everyone. It's great to see so many folks joining us today. Uh, my name is Sarah Kasprzak, and I am the co-founder of Campaign Earth. And we work to help build a powerful climate justice movement here in the state of Maine. Um, within that work, obviously, we invest in local climate solutions. And by investing, I mean not only our time and expertise, but also offering seed money to um, different groups and supporting fundraising efforts. And uh, when we're using the word climate justice, obviously, we want to bring forth different marginalized um, folks that have often not had their voices heard in the climate movement, and that includes the youth. Although over the last year to two years, um, we have certainly seen um, the youth voice become very prominent in this fight. So um, we we're very excited to be a part of this project. And uh, thank you, Sirohi. Hi, I'm Sirohi Kumar. I'm a 10th grader at Mount, De Mount Desert Island High School. Uh, we recently installed a f over 1400 panel solar array and I am a member of the eco team that was uh, part of installing that. Uh, and I recently wrote a white paper about the entire installation process that is, we hope is gonna be sp shared to other students who are interested in uh, getting solar. Thank you. And that, um, just so you know, the white paper is linked as one of the resources on our website. So if you're interested in checking that out, it's a really phenomenal resource for um, schools. So thank you. And uh, next we have uh, Jacqueline Cutford. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you so much for being here today. Um, I am Jackie Cutford, and I am a teacher at Casco Bay High School, also the advisor of the Green Team, um, and uh, also an advisor of the Solarize Project over the last couple years. And yeah, thanks for having me. Perfect. And then Lucia Durrani. Hi, guys. I'm Lucia. I'm a founding board member of Solarize, and I've been on that for two years and working alongside Siri. I'm a senior at Cascade High School as well. And Amy? Oh, uh, my video is not working, but yeah, my name is Amy Shimatu, and I'm a senior at Casco, and I'm part of the Solarize Portland team. Yeah, thanks for having me, Siri. Thank you. Um, so we're going to start off by um, just talking a little bit about what it's like to organize a school solar campaign and what that can look like. So how can students, teachers, and community members advocate for solar and what does a successful school solar campaign look like? Lucia, go ahead. Um, I think that it can look different based on where you are. I think that it's important to get um, 
a group of students and teachers who are really driven to be in it for the long haul. Um, so having a strong cohort of people for a base for the project. And then I also think it's really important to sort of start small. We started with um, our principal and got him on board very quickly. But, um, and so I think sort of slowly working up to a big idea can make a really strong group and can make a really strong project. Sirohi, I saw you raise your hand. Uh, yeah, I was gonna say a very similar thing. Um, a really important part of the installation process at Mount Desert um, was to make sure that the students were there every step of the way. Our project actually originally started in 2017 with a senior for who is for his senior ex, uh, ex, exhibition. He uh, did a audit of the school's solar potential, and it didn't. It wasn't actually economically feasible in 2017, but the changes over the last two years made it possible. Um, but that senior actually talked to a lot of the teachers and the administrators at the school about the potential of having a solar array on the school before he knew about the feasibility of it. And that really opened up the door to, the, to actually getting the uh, array installed. Thank you. I think that was everyone. Um, so our next question is, what are some misconceptions about solar energy and how would you debunk those misconceptions? Ms. Comfort, go ahead. Yeah, I think just like, um, just to echo what was um, spoken about a lot um, in the first panel, um, the idea that solar energy is uh, expense is too expensive, right? Um, and especially with the changes now, I think the legislation is difficult to stay on top of and it changes so often and that does impact the cost, um, like you uh, just said, Sirohi, Sir but I, I think that that is a misconception that people usually kind of just assume it's too expensive. Lucia? I also think that um, sort of the new idea of the feasibility of schools using solar farms, I think that's, it's often assumed that if your schools are older or if you don't want the look of solar on your school for historical reasons, we've been struggling with that a lot. And I think that the idea of a solar farm and sort of getting the information out that schools can use solar farms is really valuable in starting up a project. It sort of opens up more possibilities. And David, I saw your hand. Yeah, the uh, the flip side of what Jackie said is um, we've we've had a lot of people say, oh, well, solar keeps getting cheaper, so we'll be better off if we wait. And that's wrong because the tax credits are decreasing right now. Um, the 30% the tax credit ended last year. This year, there's a 26% tax credit, and next year, it drops to 22%. And then the following year, it drops to 10% for commercial buildings and goes away entirely for residential. And so there's a, there's a huge benefit to acting sooner to take advantage of that larger tax credit and, and getting a lower price for the, for the system. Thank you. And that transitions us into our, actually, did Sarah, did you want to respond to that? Oh, I just had another um, small misconception to push back against that. Um, like any technology, lots of times you'll hear people make comments about, well, solar only, those panels only last 15 years, or I heard, hear the inverters are crap after 12 years. And like anything, I often um, remind people, all technology is constantly evolving and improving, just like our cell phones. We can think of what they all looked like and their performance, what that looked like, say, 10 years ago, and how much that's improved. Same thing happens with any industry, and so solar panels and their inverters and other pieces of equipment that go with it have all made leaps and strides in terms of efficiency over the years. So the pushback on any community members that come forth with that concern. Thank you. Um, and I'd like to move more specifically into the subject of financing solar projects, because that's definitely a huge concern for a lot of school districts. Um, and it's hard to understand how a million dollar project can seem like a possibility for a school district. Um, so I'd love if someone could explain what are some of the financing options available to schools um, and what can that look like for school districts? David, go ahead. Yeah, so the, the most common financing mechanism for, for schools and, and municipal governments is the power purchase agreement. 
Um, and that's where someone else finances the array and owns the system and you're just paying for the electricity that's produced each month. And so uh, the, for the school, they, they end up typically paying a reduced price per kilowatt hour with, with a set term for the contract. So often a 25 year contract and they just go from paying their current electricity provider to paying for electricity through the power purchase agreement instead. Um, that's the most common method. Um, I've also worked on energy saving performance contracting projects, um, which typically um, energy saving performance contracting is used for efficiency improvements. And um, that's where there's a, a energy performance contractor who performs an investment grade audit of the, of the facility and assesses the energy savings available and can guarantee the long-term energy savings over time. And so the, the long-term energy savings are used to repay the upfront costs of those efficiency improvements. Um, and solar can be rolled into performance contracting projects as well. So that, that can be a way of funding solar in addition to a larger energy retrofit of the building. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, I just wanted to add a piece of what David just provided there with the power purchasing agreement. Um, one thing that's not available to uh, nonprofits and municipalities is taking advantage of the federal tax credit. So by using the um, power purchasing agreement, you're basically letting a private owner, um, private entity own the panels versus the school municipality or nonprofit to, in order to bring down your costs. So when you're looking at a simple math, $100,000 solar project, if you use the PPA approach, the power purchase agreement approach, the investor is able to immediately take advantage of the current um, tax credit of 26%, and that trickles down to you. If you were not um, using that, you'd be paying um, the full $100,000. So instead, um, you have a different starting point of, in that example, $74,000. Yeah, exactly. Thanks for adding that. Sure. Thank you. Um, and I think another important way that schools can take advantage of solar um, is through community solar projects. And I know legislation in the past year has played a significant role um, in expanding the potential for community solar. So um, I was wondering if anyone would be willing to talk a little bit about how community solar projects can work. Yes, David. Um, yeah, so typically a community solar project for a school would still be paid for through a power purchase agreement. Um, but the key difference is that it's at an offsite location. Um, so a large solar farm in a remote location that has you know, perfect sun exposure um, and, and doesn't have the obstructions that are often on a school roof like skylights or vents or mechanical equipment. Um, and so it doesn't have the, the constraints of working on a school roof and can be whatever size is needed. It isn't limited to the area of the roof either. Um, and so that's a way for a, a school or, or other government entity um, or, or residential now as well, any, any homeowners or, or uh, residents can, can sign up for a community solar farm share and offset their energy usage by producing it offsite in that community solar farm. Thank you. Um, so this next question is for the students on the panel. Um, and I was hoping you could talk a little bit about what motivated you to become involved in your school's solar campaign and what advice would you give to students embarking on the process? What challenges did you face? Sarahi. Um, I was not uh, one of the main contributors to the actual installation process. I was a, a freshman and I just joined the ECA team, so I wasn't very on top of what was happening, but I was actually more involved in the, after, the process afterwards. So the ribbon cutting ceremony that really brought attention to the fact that we had in, installed an array and the spreading of information about how to install an array through the white paper. Um, and I was driven to do that because of an internship I was part of. Uh, I was interning with the Climate to Thrive. Uh, and that's a really specific example, but I think it's what inspired a lot of the students who are on my school's eco team to get involved with solar 
um, was the community. We have a really supportive community around climate action. We're always, the adults are always encour encouraging youth to do things um, that might not be encouraged in other places. So I think if you're a student who's trying to do a, to, uh, take on a green initiative and you don't have motivation or you don't know how to start, I think finding adults in your community who have experience as well as other youth who might not have experience but have drive, it's a really good combination for getting so started. Lucia? Yeah, just echoing that, I think that having supportive staff is a huge, huge, um, just important part of the process. And I think that we got kickstarted just in a green team meeting and we were inspired by um, the natural beauty of Casco Bay. And we were working on a ocean acidification project and really wanted to think outside the box in ways that we can reduce our carbon footprint as a school. Um, and then just reaching out to other schools, other green teams, and then also other um, faculty at different schools, we were able to find that it was sort of a bigger um, want and a bigger desire. And that was a way to work up our goal and sort of make our dreams a little bit bigger. And I think that I've said it before, but starting small and also um, doing a lot of research, I think that the biggest struggle we faced was um, we were a cohort of students and we were going to board meetings. And I think that we weren't always, um, it sometimes felt that we weren't always listened to. And I think that really knowing what you're talking about can help feel a little less like childish. Amy, I'm not sure if you wanted to respond. I know it's a little difficult for you to raise your hand. <laughs> yeah, I think Lucia just said most of everything. We're part of the same team, so yeah. I was really motivated by like with, by the green team. Everybody seemed so dedicated, and just what we're like campaigning for was so obvious. So I just wanted to be part of the solar campaign. Thanks, Amy. Um, this. Cutbert, sorry, she was my chemistry teacher, so it's hard not to call her Miss Cutbert. Um, I was hoping you could talk a little bit about the process of being a teacher in this in this situation. What was it like to help students along in this process? Um, and what advice would you have for other teachers who want to support students? Yeah, so um, I think one thing that I would just say, like first and foremost, is a structure or time in, in our schedule that we have to meet every week. Um, and that's not a thing that all schools have. And I think that's important to name that we really took advantage of that. We had we have about an hour every Friday to meet um, with uh, different groups and clubs in our school. And so therefore, that was the time we had to meet as a green team and for the past couple years have been, um, you know, chipping away and staying consistent with this project. So I'd say structurally, just like, um, that could be something that school, uh, you, that students could advocate for if that time isn't there in your schedule. Or um, if, you know, if you have any other way to figure out a time to actually make sure you can get together with the group that you're organizing with um, consistently. And then as a teacher, I think uh, I, I, I definitely, was lucky to have really strong student leaders, um, for sure. I mean, you guys did so much of the organizing and the work, but I think what my role was, was sometimes to step up and help and sometimes to step back and let, um, let the students in the group kind of grapple with the, the thing they were dealing with and, um, and also to feel empowered that it was the, really their project and not, not my project. Um, so I'd like to think I, <laughs> I kind of created the space and fostered that, but um, I was also able to step back and let um, students have ownership over the project. And then I'll also just add, um, we definitely had a lot of help from our administration and also, um, and also other community members, which I think as teachers, um, we can facilitate um, connecting students with other community members. And so I would also say that is a, is a suggestion that I have for different teachers trying to encourage students to, to really take on projects that are that are bigger scale or that take that kind of 
spread beyond the walls of the school building. That segues nicely into um, our next question, which uh, is for primarily Sarah, but if anyone wants to hop in, you're welcome to. Um, I was hoping you could talk a little bit about how you became involved in Solarize Portland um, and what it's like to be a community member, stepping into a school and working with a school. Um, so what advice can you offer to community members who want to help schools advocate for solar energy but don't know where to start? Thank you. Um, well, I think for me, uh, when I learned about the project, this is obviously very much aligns with the work that Campaign Earth does, but there's also many organizations around the state of Maine that have a similar mission in wanting to uh, work on climate change, reduce our carbon footprint, bring on more environmentally friendly solutions here in Maine because um, we have one of the highest asthma rates in the country and thinking about cleaning up our air is obviously at the forefront of many folks' minds. So um, for the students, I would put forth when you start thinking about a project to think about the nonprofits that exist in your community that are also doing similar work and reach out to them because you sort of have hopefully a, a very eager and uh, free <laughs> um, sort of base to help you get some of the work done. There are, um, nonprofits can also serve as the liaison between the school community and the, the greater community, making some connections that may not already exist um, within the school community. Um, and business owners and other um, folks that are like-minded. So um, I think if you are a, a nonprofit looking to get involved, just making yourself known, reaching out to um, the schools in your community to say, you know, I was recently uh, on a call learning about solar, the solar movement in Maine schools. I want you to know that I work here locally on this. I'm anxious to get involved if there's any um, projects or students interested in bringing this forth. I know that folks within our organization would want to support it. Um, I think um, this got spoken to a little bit in terms of the time frame, but we are under a, sort of a different uh, stress with pa the pandemic because it's going to be harder to get work done right now. And as someone mentioned, the tax credits are dramatically dropping off in the coming years. So for students that may be on the call that are interested in doing this, even though um, life looks very differently right now, those tax credits are set um, to expire within the next two years. So to try to continue moving forward with this work right now is actually really important. Hopefully we will see perhaps some new things coming out of Washington. Although, you know, with this current administration, I have my doubts that that is what we'll be seeing, um, but perhaps the, the um, tax credits will get extended. Um, but another thing that we do, um, well, Campaign Earth does specifically, but I imagine other nonprofits would be similar, is we help um, with the public awareness sort of campaign and raising public interest and help organizing um, events, fundraisers, et cetera, to help ease the burden of that piece while the students are working to inform um, their board, their other um, school members, et cetera. Yeah, can I just say really quick um, that I just wanted to amplify what you just said, Sarah, around fundraising. Like uh, as a teacher, I definitely, A, don't really have the skills and B, um, I think that that felt like a thing that was outside of um, the time that I could allot to supporting students with this. And so I just wanted to thank you for really being there for us for fundraising and also um you know in in it's a great example of of community members um offering their expertise in in collaborating with students and teachers on these projects thank you and i, I think it it adds to that just it's an opportunity for suddenly everybody to see how many folks in the community really are interested when you have your first fundraiser and suddenly you know hundreds of people step forward to help make a donation. It helps share your message. It makes your message that much stronger that, hey, there's actually community-wide support for this as people step forward and make donations. So, thank you. I will also add on to that by saying, um, we were, we when we began fundraising Solarize Portland, we did it not with the goal of um, paying for the billions of dollars worth of solar panels, 
that's a lot of money. And um, the power purchase agreement and those financing plans exist so that you can pay that money over a long period of time with no upfront costs. Um, what we were fundraising for and what made a tremendous difference in the process of um, it convincing our school board and city council to consider solar was um, having that money to offset costs. So at all of the costs that might have otherwise been um, difficult for districts to bear, um, like ops, for instance, like the cost of like roof engineering assessments, um, or we also paid for an independent consulting firm to do some of the um, estimates for us and um, draft the request for proposals and things like that. So we weren't actually paying the money we raised wasn't necessarily used for paying for the panels, but rather to offset some of the costs that might um, that might prevent school districts from even considering it in the first place because they're um, they feel held back by the fact that there are all these little costs that add up. Um, so that was that made a huge difference. So you don't have to think about raising millions of dollars, just a couple of if you can raise several hundred dollars or even um, a, several thousand dollars like that can make a huge difference in in the smaller costs that make a, a larger a larger impact on the decision. Um, so I've gotten a lot of great questions from audience members. Um, oh, that, that was a quick quick question, I'll answer this one first. We raised over $25,000 um, and that was through uh, a GiveGab campaign, reaching out to local businesses um, and also uh, several grants. So it was a combination of, and that was over two years. Um, and so we were shocked. We did not expect to raise that much money at all. We set out with the intention of like raising $250. But I think there is this kind of pent up excitement and um, individuals who don't necessarily consider solar for their own homes because it's not out of their price range or out of their um, just out of their knowledge or consideration, but they do want to support renewable energy projects. So I think there are a lot of people who are really interested in in solar um, and supporting solar projects. So you'd be surprised if you launch a fundraising campaign, how much you can raise. Um, so thank you for that question, Cynthia. Um, and then we also have some other questions from audience members. Uh, Sophie was wondering a little bit more about the offsite solar, the remote solar farms and uh, how that can work for school districts. And how much does buying land for an offsite solar farm usually cost? So I and then Sarah. Um, yeah, the that's all handled as part of the project. Um, it's And it's all rolled into the power purchase agreement. So whoever you're working with to create the project takes care of the land acquisition and filing with the utility and all the all the necessary steps on that side of the, the project development. Um, and right now in Maine, there's been kind of a big land rush. Um, there's been a lot of out of state companies that have been reaching out to landowners. They can see based on Google Maps and, and available information, hey, you own 40 acres of land right on this three phase utility line. Are you interested in, in uh, creating a solar farm. And that's not actually a very good tactic because a lot of that land is prime farmland and farmers don't want to give up their good land for a solar farm. Uh, what we're finding really successful with revision is we're meeting with landowners and talking with them. And a lot of farms will have five or 10 acres of land that isn't productive and doesn't have good soil and they can't get it to work growing food. And that's great land to put a solar farm on. Um, and so having the local connections and working with the landowners, um, it, it's a complex process though, uh, because the real limitation is the utility infrastructure um, and the utility substations can only handle a certain amount of solar backfeed. And what we're seeing right now is that a lot of substations are, are getting filled up with prospective projects. And so we're limited in where solar farms can be located um, at, at least for the for the short term, um, until until some of these projects either get built or or get removed from the from the stack of, of potential projects, um, and so 
there's there's several constraints and the whatever whoever you partner with for um, the power purchase agreement um, would be able to help with with all of those aspects of it. Sarah, did you have anything to add to that? Um, all I was going to say, I think David did a great job explaining that. Was I, if I remember right, the question uh, the person asked about bu the, buying the land, but most typically in these situations, the land is not bought. It's um, you just lease the land to place the panels on, so there you don't have this big cost of having to purchase the land. You're actually oftentimes helping a, a farmer keep his land instead of maybe selling it off to a developer because suddenly he has, he, or, he or she has a new stream of income for the next 20 years or however long the agreement is to keep the panels there. Is that right, David? Yeah, exactly. Great. So um, we have another question from Kelsey Johnson, um, which is about the role of adults and um, adults as allies. Uh, she asks, how can adults be bigger allies? No youth should jump into a board meeting without a kind of expectations norm setting process. What do you think, uh, what do you need to feel you, what do you, for the youth, what do you need to feel like you are listened to? And Amy, if you want to respond, just yell it out. I can answer this question in the meantime, and then I'll go to you, Lucia. Um, I think this has definitely um, been one of one interesting thing. I've been to a lot of environmental activist gatherings in Maine, and I think um, it's a constant challenge because there's such an active um, group of individuals who are really passionate about these issues. Um, and Maine's an older state. We have um, a large amount of our population um, are older people. So, and it can sometimes feel like in those gatherings were um, some of the only youth in the room, uh, which can be challenging. And, um, but I think having adult wisdom is so valuable. And um, throughout this entire process, the, the, the feedback and support and guidance we've received from adults has been truly um, it's, it's had a significant impact on what we've been capable of, what we thought we were capable of. So I think it's really important to have those youth adult mentorships. Um, and because we can't do it by ourselves, we have the passion and we have um, the excitement about the issues, but it's just simply not possible to um, do this without some sort of wisdom or guidance from adults. So that, that would be my response. Um, Lucia, I'm not sure if you want to add to that. Yeah, I, uh, Siri covered most of what I was also thinking, but I think that something that we often had as an experience that really helped us was we were thinking these big lofty ideas and then in practice and in execution, it was really helpful to have people who um, were a little more experienced in life in general. I think an example of that is we, we did a march and so when we were thinking about our route, we were thinking, oh, how many people can see us? Or what's the longest distance we can get without people getting tired? And then some of the adults in the room were like, yeah, and also how are we gonna get sort of like, how are we gonna be allowed to do these things and have these many people in the streets? And so I think having a little bit more of a practical eye can be really helpful to have an adult in the room. Thank you. Um, so, um, my next question is for uh, David, and um, he's been super involved in promoting energy efficiency at schools, especially in Nevada. So I was hoping you could talk a little bit about how schools can pair solar campaigns with energy efficiency initiatives, and what, it's, what's that, what has that looked like at some of the schools um, you work with? Yeah, awesome. Um, I like to look at the whole energy picture and identifying all the energy uses in the building. Um, and for many schools, the cost for heating, whether it's heating oil or propane, is actually more than what they spend on electricity. And certainly the carbon footprint is much greater burning heating oil 
um, than, than using the grid electricity. And so um, in many cases, looking at efficiency and transitioning off of fossil fuels for heating um, can have a tremendous impact on reducing the carbon footprint and, and reducing the energy costs. Um, and I've, I've engaged with students um, through, the, through the curriculum that we developed in Nevada. Um, I worked with about 50 teachers while I was out there. Um, and there was one school in particular where um, a teacher organized a green team at the school and had about a half dozen students that were really motivated. And I helped them conduct a lighting assessment of the school and they counted all the light bulbs and identified what the energy usage of the lighting was and put a proposal into the to the school principal and the and the school board to change out all the lighting in their schools and had all the numbers to, to document the energy savings and um, and that it would pay for itself in about two years through the energy savings um, and because they put that proposal together um, it turned out that the following year the school district received a grant from the utility to install solar at about eight or 10 schools. There's, there's 120 ish schools in Reno, Nevada. So it's a big school district. Um, and because of the effort that they had done putting together a proposal to change their lighting to LEDs, um, their school was awarded one of the solar arrays. And so now their entire parking lot has solar shade canopies over the top of it. Um, and so you never really know like what else is happening in the background, what other organizations have funding or, or have projects that they're trying to get going. And so, you know, the more engaged you can be and, and the more you can do on your own, um, the better, like the further you're going to get. And, um, and in particular, often efficiency projects are more accessible. Um, anyone can change a light bulb. It's, it's pretty straightforward to upgrade lighting or to, to swap out equipment that's inefficient, um, like, like old refrigerators or things like that. Um, and so it can be a nice stepping stone in the right direction. Um, and also doing an assessment or an energy audit of the school and identifying all the energy use and all the energy costs um, can help to prioritize you know, where, where the most waste is. Uh, many of our schools in Maine are, are really poorly insulated. And so improving the air sealing and the insulation and those types of things and keeping the heat in the building um, can then allow for a smaller, more efficient heating system that's potentially from a clean energy source, whether that's electricity or um, wood-fired boiler or those types of things. Um, there's, there's lots of options to get off of fossil fuels. And, um, and, and that's, that's a step towards 100% clean energy and, and then you know, producing enough solar to then offset all your other usage um, to, to look at the whole building and put that in perspective. So um, we've, we've had some success with that. And, um, and then there's, there's some great opportunities in Maine and, and hopefully we can, we can help transition all of our schools to 100% clean energy. Thank you. Um, so one of, uh, we've received some questions about what kind of actual dollar savings can a, a high school expect from a solar array. And I know that um, this also goes back to some of the solar legislation. I was searching through my research paper trying to find this statistic. Um, and Sirohi, if you want to add on after I, I say this, but I think the statistics from Mount Desert Island High School are pretty significant. Um, before the LD 1711, which Robert referred to earlier, but this was a really um, transformative uh, piece of legislation that went through last June. Um, so that before that, the original cost saving, estimated cost savings for the Mount Desert Island High School solar array were about uh, $293,000 over 25 years. And then the estimated savings after the legislation had passed rose to um, close to $1,465,000. So that is a significant increase and that shows how, um, how transformative legislation can be and what impact that can have on cost savings. But that just gives you also an idea of what cost savings can um, look like. Sirhi, I'm not sure if there's anything you wanted to add on to that. Yeah. Um... I, the Siri is right that that's exactly what happened. Um, on the white paper, we actually have these graphs that show the savings over 25 years. 
in four possible scenarios. So with and without the legislation and with and without the buyout from the PPA. Um, so if the school had uh, paid for the whole thing. And it's really amazing just to see how that legislation how the legislation and the power purchase agreement totally transformed the uh, capacity of the school. Thank you. Um, and I actually, if you wouldn't mind elaborating a little bit on the bio option, I f f don't quite recall if um, Mount Desert has chosen to go with that, but just talk about the difference and what that means in a power purchase agreement. So um, as was said before, in a power purchase agreement, the agreement is that, uh, private investor owns the panels for amount of, for a significant amount of time. Um, and then this, the school in this case can choose to buy it back uh, at a lower cost and the investor gets the tax write off. Um, so I'm not, uh, I'm not entirely sure what Mount Desert MDIHS has chosen. I'm pretty sure we've chosen to go with the buyout. Um, but in this case, the buyout scenario does lead to increased savings every single year. So it is the best option to save money. Thank you. Um, and I, one question from Cynthia was, what support information is the Solarize group offering to student groups that want to do this? Um, and I can touch on this question. So the goal is after the summit that the website will be a, a available resource for schools um, and, and has the white paper that Sierra he has mentioned as well as a solar roadmap created by Joe Blotnick of uh, Climate to Thrive and that's a super helpful resource. I know I used it quite a bit um, and uh, there's also a guide that I created with the help of some experts with um, just basic information about how to get started with the organizing campaign. Um, so the goal is that we can continue to add resources and expand those resources as um, we gain them and as um, more schools and students go through this experience. So continue, if you have any of your resources, continue to share them with me. Um, and uh, ideally we can build this network and use it as a, a support net for students interested in, in leading these campaigns at their school. Um, so I, we also, received a question about, um, oh yes, and from a question from Emma, the webinar will be available to the public. We'll post it on our website and we'll also send it to everyone who registered. And um, one final question, um, thank you all for your audience questions, those were excellent. Um, and if you wanna continue to ask questions, uh, we're gonna open the breakout rooms at the end. Uh, we'll take a brief break at 5.30 and um, so people can decide which breakout rooms they'd like to attend. And for people who are not um, staying on the call, they can um, leave then. But so for this final question, um, I'd like to ask all the panelists, what are, you, what are your hopes for Maine Solar Future? And um, what are your hopes for youth role in, the, in that solar future? Sarah. Well, my hope would be that we end up putting solar on every school across the state. Um, I think there's been some exciting uh, changes, up, as we already mentioned, up, at, up in Augusta through legislature and obviously from the great work that's happening at Mount Desert Island schools, as well as the ones here in Portland, we are now um, able to put forth tools and resources to show other school communities how this can be done. Um, and as uh, other folks mentioned, uh, Maine is now basically uh, sort of seeing people making phone calls all the time to look at possible places to put big solar arrays. So the opportunity is now and uh, with the federal tax credits set to um, expire as well, uh, time is of the essence for sc other schools to join in on this great project. So um, I would, and just to offer that Campaign Earth is here to help with other groups that um, may want our expertise as they move forward in the process, but I'm hoping to see this replicated around the state. Lucia? Yeah, I think obviously a big lofty hope would be that um, we see all the schools with solar, but I think that um, even if that isn't seen, seeing more youth sort of speaking out and taking action in their schools to get 
a green team running or to have little tiny small green acts and just feeling motivated to do what they're passionate about in the environment to make their little steps and impacts on their community. Sorry. Yeah, I think that this opportunity of the installation has really taught me a lot about how schools work, about how change is made, and especially about how much youth can do um, within their communities to make huge change. So I, my hope is that even if we don't get every school in Maine to install solar panels, I think that um, I hope that every student who's involved in one of these processes really learns the true impact that they have. David, go ahead. Yeah, absolutely. I agree with uh, what everyone else has said. Um, I, I think we absolutely have to put solar on every school in Maine, um, ideally within the next five years. Um, the schools really need to be a beacon for the rest of the community, a, a starting point for everyone. Um, we, we need to put solar on as many homes and in as many businesses as we possibly can throughout the state. And the, the schools are the perfect starting point um, to, to lead our communities, um, both for um, the, the visible, visual aspect of it, as well as the educational um, benefits of having it on the school building. Um, and, and I see, I have great hope. We're going to need thousands more solar installers in the coming years, thousands more people working in the efficiency industry in Maine, transitioning our homes to more off of fossil fuels into clean energy. And so I think all of you are going to be welcome in the clean energy industry. And, and it's such a broad industry ranging from policy and advocacy to installations to um, coordinating amongst uh, other people. And there, there's just so many roles to be played. And um, it's so exciting to see all your leadership at this point. And I look forward to working with you for many years to come. Thank you. And um, thank you so much to all of our experts. Let's give them a virtual, virtual round of applause. <laughs> it's been so great having you. Um, and you've all provided such excellent words of advice and uh, wisdom. So thank you for your time. Um, and so at this point, we're going to take a five minute break before transitioning into breakout rooms. I would like to emphasize that these breakout rooms, we're trying to open the space for students and teachers only um, so they can ask their school specific questions. Um, so if you could um, please be willing to generously open those rooms up for students and teachers only, that would be great. Um, and if you are interested in participating in the breakout rooms, Abby is momentarily going to send the list of which experts which will be in each room. Um, and, and if you are interested in attending the breakout sessions, um, just chat your name and we will send you to that breakout room. Chat your name and the number you, of the breakout room you wanna, you wanna attend. So thank you so much. And um, again, a reminder just to fill out the exit survey um, that will be sent out to all people who registered. Um, it's also on our website if you'd like to check that out. So thank you again for attending. We're gonna take a brief five minute break if you're staying for the, um, the breakout sessions, but thank you so much. And goodbye to everyone who is um, leaving. And thank you, Siri. Yeah, so the the list will just send the list of breakout sessions. So um, just chat the number of the room you'd like to attend if you're interested in attending that.